Should we even do an intro? <clears throat> All right, let's try this again. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, so the other day I tried out a new feature in this software to where I could live stream to Instagram. And I did a test for like 10 minutes, but I deleted YouTube to put in Instagram. So it would just kind of go there and I could do my test. And uh, it didn't go well. I mean, it broadcast there, but there was no audio. So I don't know what's wrong with that. Then today when I tried to do today's YouTube, it just kind of forgot where everything was. And I was streaming to my other YouTube channel that I never use. <laughs> I was like, where is everybody? There's no one showing up. And uh, so I hit delete and I tried it again and it did it again. And so I went, look, I was like, all right. So I deleted, I started fresh. Here I am, semi flustered, just a little bit annoyed that uh, whatever, you don't need the, the sob story. Uh, today's, <laughs> I typed out everything in the description, but uh, we're just going to go ahead and flesh it out verbally because I've done it three times now. So uh, we're going to talk about when you have to relocate your livestock temporarily because either your tank leaked, you're moving to a new location and you need something simpler to, to transport, or possibly you got a new upgrade and it's going exactly where the old tank is. You need all that out of the way to put the new one there. What do you do with your stuff? Especially if you're taking your sweet time, like I have done a few times in my life. So we're kind of go, going to go back in time to uh, 2010 when on July 3rd, I realized that my 280 gallon was leaking. Now, 280 gallons is a lot of livestock that had to go somewhere. And at the time, what I ended up doing was using, I used a couple of 100 gallon Rubbermaid troughs. And I put them right in the middle of my kitchen. And then I put all my livestock in there. But what I did more than that, <clears throat> I, whenever I find myself in a situation where you can sort of operate off the current filtration, that's usually my goal. So for example, <clears throat> or to clarify, when I have a leaking aquarium, but everything in the sump is perfectly fine, I might plumb right back in, well, I have plumbed right into that sump with the temporary tank off to the side, and the plumbing just went over to it. And that was my solution. Now, like I said before, if you are trying to move everything out of the way, you can't quite do what I'm describing. But let's just say you're in a similar situation to me, your big tank is leaking, you're gonna get a new tank to put above it again, above the sump. <clears throat> so there's no reason to do anything with your filtration beneath because it's currently working, it's doing its job, the refugium is fine, the skimmer's operating like it should, you've got all your dosing in place. All you need to do is create a brand new quote unquote display tank that you can put everything in to keep it healthy and just make sure the water goes into it properly and drains back out all the way into where your sump is sitting. So that's what I wanted to show you. Let me find my first picture here. I have a few to show you today. Let's see. They're so tiny. Mm, this looks, no, this looks better. All right, so we'll put this, let me scoot myself over a little bit here. And we're gonna put this right here on the screen. So what I did there, you can see the Rubbermaid trough there's one higher than the second one, and the water would drain from the bottom one and go through the wall to where the sump was. And the return pump would push water into the top uh, Rubbermaid bin, which would then drain into the lower Rubbermaid. So it was like a two-tier pond, so to speak. Water goes on the top, pours down, goes back to the sump. And it did this for seven months. <laughs> So when I say temporarily, I don't mean like a day or two. I mean, you know, it might be a week or two. It might be a month. I tend to be super patient when I do things. And so because of that, I um, will allow something to go a very long time because I want to make sure what I'm setting up next will be perfect. So I'm going to scoot this over a little bit here. I, I do want to kind of zoom. I'm going to make a big screen for you so you can see the whole thing. So what you've got here, 200 gallon Rubbermaid troughs. You can see the Vortec pumps are affixed to the Rubbermaid to create flow in there. 
and I used a filter sock that I could tie. It was a drawstring filter sock, and I put it around the pipe to catch any kind of stuff that was coming out of the first trough. The first one was mainly full of SPS corals and fish. And then the lower one was all my live rock and all my LPS corals. And the lighting above it was rigged over a, with a 2x4 assembly to keep everything in place and keep it safe. I did not want to have some kind of weird tripod system on my floor that I could potentially kick because if I were to knock the whole thing over, I could shatter the lights, electrocute the tank, who knows what. I needed something very, very stable and safe and trustworthy. So let me go ahead and delete this picture and show you a different one. Um, this picture here will go big again. So you, from the other angle, you, well, you can see everything old about my house. The old walls, the old tile, the old back door. <laughs> um, the only thing that's the same is the red wall. So in the blue barrel, that was actually a barrel full of live rock that I was just keeping in circulation. And it was also... Um, no, I think it was standalone. It just had a, a mag pump in there to keep circulation in there. I didn't use it as part of natural filtration. I just wanted the, the extra rock somewhere safe that I didn't use in the troughs. And then all of the, uh, the bigger Rubbermaid bin is sitting on top of Haydike blocks. The concrete blocks have the hollow holes. And I want to point out a couple things. So number one, they're sitting on pink foam that I cut out the same shape as a block. So that way it wouldn't scratch the tile because I didn't want to destroy my kitchen floor. Secondarily, I put a large board across the top of the block to support the rubber made evenly. I tethered all of my electrical. You can see the power strip is hanging under the rim of the trough. So I could reach in and do something, but I wouldn't drip down and actually get the cords wet. And I wouldn't, and even then the cords are hanging downward for that drip loop to not allow water to go into the outlets themselves. And this worked out perfectly during that whole duration. I also affixed my Vortec drivers to the side with some Velcro to keep them off the floor. I didn't want anything on the floor that I could, you know, hit my feet against. And again, the light rack itself was mounted onto the bins. And then let me go ahead and get rid of that picture. And I'm going to put this one here because, nope, that's not what I want to do. I want to drag it over here. Here we go. So now you can see in this picture here, some of the corals and you can see how I notched the bottom of the two by fours to be the exact same diameter as the rim. So it actually snugly sat on there. And this method worked perfectly. It was great. I um, didn't have any concerns whatsoever that my lighting was gonna budge or fall. It was one leg on this trough and two legs on the other. So basically a tripod, right? But then above it, I also had my ballasts. So they were right here on the top sitting on a shelf above the lights so that they stayed nice and dry. And then I used really long, I think they were 12 or 15 foot extension cords that would stretch from this all the way back into the fish room to plug in at the top of my uh, wall where I had all of my current components for the Apex. So I had my Apex controller inside the fish room. I had outlets up above that probably used X10 modules or something because it was the aqua controller days. And I had you know, normally my ballast would plug in there. Well, now they're sitting way out there in the next in the kitchen area. I went ahead and I took my uh, long extension cord, plugged it in there, followed it across the room. I think I tied it up somewhere up high to keep it out of my way. And then it came down to the ballast and connected the ballast. So that way I could use the aqua controller <clears throat> to continually talk to the sump system, the filtration, and uh, operate all the equipment, whether it was heaters or pumps or skimmer or calcium reactor, all the things I've been doing forever. <laughs> and this system worked out really, really well for me. And it got the aquarium out of my way. So that way I could go ahead and I could enjoy uh, working on the fish room or working around the aquarium itself. Now, there's a couple of downsides to putting livestock in a Rubbermaid trough. Number one, you can only see from above. And really the only way you can see is when you turn off the flow to stop the surface movement to get a good look. And one of the things I discovered after seven months of my livestock being in there when it was time to move it into the new 400 gallon was that all the corals looked really great from above. But when I looked at them from the side, you know, when I lifted them up and held them out, there was a lot of undergrowth death. And it was, it was really like mostly alive at the tips. 
So it was too long in those troughs, you know, so seven months was too long. But that's how long it took for me to get that room ready and to get the new aquarium delivered. And it just is what it is. And I still had lots of frags to work with to start the new tank, which is where everything got started for the aquarium that's behind me today. But um, that was one method. And then, <laughs> unfortunately, 13 months later, my beautiful 400 gallon sprung a leak. And then I had to set up an entirely different tank. And that's what I was looking for to show you guys um, when I had all these problems with the live stream today. So if you'll be patient with me for a moment, I'm gonna try to find the 400 gallon leak blog. So we got this and that was when, well, 2012. Let me try something else. Because I document everything online, sometimes I get lucky and I can find things. Nope, can't find it the easy way. <laughs> I was hoping for it. Uh, so what happened when the 400 sprung a leak, I'm scrolling through the Google image to see if I'll come across some magic here. Um, I then had to scramble for something to hold livestock for a 400 gallon tank that was actually doing quite well. And you know, the tank, it was already in distress. I mean, so number one, 50% of the water came out, you know, or I drained it down to 50% to get the leak to stop flooding the floor. And then I had to leave town and told my tank sitter good luck. And uh, when I came back from the trip, I'd already lost some corals because there's not much I could do. I mean, what I did before I left while the tank was leaking, and this isn't a tank leaking thing, this is just a prelude to what happened with the, the livestock. But what I did was I took as much of the upper livestock and put it down low because I only had this much water in the aquarium, this much water. And so I had to uh, move all the SPS down on the sand. I had to rearrange things a little bit and I had to tell my tanks that are just kind of top off and drain some water down once a day. And uh, hopefully we can just kind of keep things in lagoon mode uh, livestock wise until I get back. As soon as I got back, I called a few different fish stores and said, do you have an aquarium that I can borrow or I can rent for probably three months? Because I feel it's gonna take two or three months to get this aquarium rep uh, repaired by Marineland. And uh, I was lucky, one of the stores, Roberts Reef told me Actually, we just took all the livestock out of an aquarium in uh, North Fort Worth, and so that tank is empty. And I said, who does it belong to? <laughs> because I know everyone, right? And he told me, I was like, oh my God, it's actually a really good friend of mine. So I called him up and I said, hey, listen, my 400 leaked and I need to borrow your 215, is that okay? And he said, Mark, you can absolutely use it for as long as you need to. And I was like, wow, thank you very much. So we, we as in me and a group of people, rushed over to his house. I had a trailer on the back of my vehicle. I had a Ford Explorer then. And we filled the trailer and the Explorer <laughs> and maybe uh, another, another truck or two. I mean, it's possible other people got, you know, used their vehicles that was so long ago. And we took this 210 gallon, 210 or 215, maybe that's why I couldn't find it. I typed 210, a 215 gallon Starfire tank, six feet long, probably 28 inches wide, 30 inches tall and it came with a stand, a sump that I had built, <laughs> and the canopy, and we hauled it all to my house. And then we had to figure out where we we're gonna put this tank because the 400 gallon is right there and you know, the wall, it's huge. But I had this area in the corner of my fish room that I thought might work. And I grabbed the tape measure and I was like, you guys won't believe it. I actually have room for a 215 gallon of reef <laughs> inside the fish room behind the 400 gallon. And so we got the stand in there first. We left the sump inside there, but we didn't need it. And, I, and then we brought the aquarium in and got it on the top of the stand. I th I'm not even sure how we got it into the room, to be honest. We probably took the door off the hinges from the garage side and, you know, manhandled it into the room and got it up against the wall. But then I had to go ahead and I had to hook up the drains and I had to run the drain lines across the floor and into the current sump under the 400 gallon. Because like I said, if I can keep the sump operational the whole time, Filtration's taken care of. I'm not gonna have to worry about a cycle or anything new happening because everything is as it should be. I just need a new box on top with more salt water and then put all my livestock in it. And that's what we did. We, um, I had my big poly tank filled up with 250 gallons of salt water. 
we got the 215 plumbed in and I used a lot of spa flex. You know, the stuff that looks like PVC, but it's bendy. Is this dog driving you guys crazy? <laughs> I hope it's not too bad. Um, and I ran the plumbing from the drains of the 215 under the cabinet. I took the doors off the front of the stand and just put them aside in another room just for safekeeping. And then I ran the pipes down across the floor in front of the pump, uh, in front of the sump and plumbed a drain into the sump and I plumbed the return pump to that line that went all the way across the floor and back up and inside the 215 and came out the lock line at the top. We also washed some sand because I never want to use sand that's more than six months old because it's too dirty. If the sand bed from your aquarium that you're having to relocate is less than six months, you can usually scoop it out and just put in the next thing and no big deal. But when it's over, a, when it's more than six months, then at that point, what you need to do is go ahead and rinse it out really well to get the detritus out and then take that clean sand and put it in your temporary tank. And this is what I've always done. I've never had a cycle or anything weird happen. Matter of fact, washing sand does not cause a cycle. Putting new sand in an aquarium does not cause a cycle. Sand is sand. Then we added all the salt water to it. And uh, then because I had the walk board on the back of the 400 gallon, we could stand there and reach in the aquarium and get corals out. And then I had a step ladder, a six footer sitting next to the 215 and I would pass a piece of livestock to the person on the ladder who would then put it in the 215. And we transferred all the, the coral over and rock and stuff. You know, it was kind of a, uh, a hodgepodge of assembly. But it ended up working out quite well. And then with the, the aquarium, again, it was only this deep now in water, I could go ahead and scoop out the fish and just hand them to the person and they put it in because it was all the same water. Well, technically, no, it wasn't. <laughs> That's not true. Um, the water in the aquarium was lagoon style. It couldn't drain into the filtration down below. So I had the sump working to the temporary tank and then we had to just move livestock over. But I made sure that all the parameters were the same so I could just move things without having to do an acclimation situation. And I did use filter socks at that time to capture a lot of detritus that kicks up from when you're doing a lot of deep moving. Because when you're making a lot of changes and you're scooping things out and you're, you're lifting things up, of course detritus is going to come out of every pore of every rock. Jackie, come on, be nice. And uh, yeah, be a good girl. Thank you. She's here, y'all. And uh, we were able to move all the livestock in there. And then at that point, come here, Jack. Come here. Let me take this off. Let me take this off. Good girl. And then we uh, had a temporary tank off to the side so I could focus on the 400 gallon, which my job was then was to clean it, make it pristine so that hopefully someone would fly out and fix the tank in place. That's what I wanted. <laughs> That's not what happened, but it's what I wanted. So I, like I said, I want this tank to run for maybe three months. My, I was fortunate because my friend said, use it as long as you want to. And, uh, and the fish store was aware of this because I guess they had probably accepted it or bought it, but they knew my search situation and they just said, yeah, you'll just use it until you are done. And then when you're done, you can sell it for us. And I said, oh, okay, no problem. And so I was told to sell the tank, stand, canopy, sump for $600. And, uh, but it didn't stay in that fish room for only three months. It ended up being in there much, much longer. It was in the corner and my livestock was growing into colonies again and my fish were fat and happy. And uh, I ended up waiting a total, total time of 18 months until I got my new tank. <laughs> it, was, it was quite the ordeal. But my livestock was completely safe for 18 months in the temporary tank. Just like the livestock previously was essentially safe except for the SPS they didn't do so well in the in the Rubbermaid troughs for seven months so if you are in a situation where you are trying to set up your dream tank in a certain spot and you know it's not going to be something you do in a weekend you know because you're going to want to like reinforce the floors you want to weatherproof the wall you want to run an extra circuit or two for electricity and you've got all these things you have to do in that spot where the tank is going to go and then as you're setting it up, you're like, well, I want to get this just right. I want to get that just right. You need the livestock to be safe and, and uh, cared for and uh, easy to maintain. You know, not, you don't want to be dealing with stuff where you're trying to constantly adjust a valve on a pump to make a pump. I mean, for example, 
Sometimes people will try to do this. They will try to set up a siphon of the water out of the tank into a sump, and then they want to take a pump and they want to put a, a ball valve or a gate valve on it to dial in the exact amount of water that can keep up with a siphon, which never works. It never, ever works. You can't do it. Every single day, you're gonna have to tweak the valve, probably twice a day, because it's gonna get a little too full, it's gonna get a little too low. <laughs> and this is quite a beating. So we wanna make sure that the temporary tank is 100% stable. It's got a heater, it's got lights, it's got filtration of whatever kind, whether it's a hang on back, a canister filter, an actual sump. I mean, whatever you gotta do, it should be just like your main aquarium always was, something reliable. And if you set it up reliably, then while it is just being its own thing and just growing quietly, you can take your time on your big project to get everything just right. So when it's time to move the livestock in, it's exactly how you envisioned it. And if, if that is how you approach your project, if you don't say, oh, they'll be okay in a bucket with an air stone. I mean, that's temporary. I mean, that is hours, not days and weeks and months, okay? So we wanna make sure that we have something we can work with. Now, let's say you have a 90 gallon aquarium and you're going to set up, I don't know, a 250 gallon aquarium, but you don't have a spot for the 90. You might have a spot for a 40. And so you could create a smaller, more condensed version of your 90. And you can take the extra rock and put it in the sump, or you can put it in a barrel with circulation and just keep it covered so that way it just basically is shedding the decay and the waste and the algae that's in, you know, that's all over the rock. You know, you can basically let it kind of, not really cure, but get better. And I can get into that in a moment with you and explain what I mean by that. But uh, what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that that 40 gallon is rocking and rolling. And we don't want anything temporary that can fall over. You wanna make sure it's on a stable stand. You wanna make sure the lights can't accidentally be bumped into the tank. Like sometimes I see people put lights on top of a couple of two by fours that are sitting on top of the aquarium. Well, that's fine for like an hour. But when you're having to keep livestock in there for a few weeks, there's a good chance something's gonna go wrong something's gonna nudge a two by four and the light's just gonna fall in and short out and trip a breaker and kill stuff. So I wanna make sure that your lights are secure. I, I always try to set everything up for a worst case scenario. And then if you can, if you have the ability, if you have the right equipment for it, you know, you can put in your emergency backups. Like you may have a battery system um, from IceCap or from Ecotech that can keep your Vortec or Vectra pump running if there's a power outage where you don't have to rush it immediately into uh, panic mode and find a generator, get the power inverter, but it just keeps running until the power comes back on. We talked about power outages last week, so I'm not gonna dwell on that. But I, I do wanna emphasize that you can actually go the extra mile with your temporary tank to make sure everything is really, really safe and stable. If you have an, uh, some kind of a controller, the Hydros, uh, the, the um, GHL or you have the Apex, you can hook that up to the temporary tank and move all the probes into it. You'll still know the tank temperature. You'll still know the pH. You'll still know um, if uh, it can activate the heaters on and off. Make sure that the heaters you use on the smaller tank are the right size. You're gonna have to spend a little bit of money when you set up a temporary tank, right? You might have to buy the 40 breeder and then you're gonna need to get a, a heater for like 120 watts, basically, maybe 150 at the most. But you know, don't take your 300 watt heaters and just plunk them in there because if the heater somehow goes wrong, it'll cook your tank and that's a problem. Hoping let me do something here. All right. Hopefully the live stream didn't skip. We just, a phone call tried to come in. <laughs> so I was a little worried about that. Um, another important thing you'll have to do when you do this uh, temporary tank is test the water weekly. I already tell you guys to do this anyway, but do it anyway. <laughs> do it on that tank. It's really important, especially now that you've changed things, you wanna make sure that that water is completely safe and that all their parameters are staying in check because now you, you went from a 90 to a 40, because the water's more condensed, you're gonna be in a situation where the, um, uh, the parameters can swing more rapidly because 
there's less forgiveness in a smaller body of water. Those of you guys with nano tanks, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you are keeping something like, there's one person on this channel that has a six and a half gallon. There's another person that has, there's another person that has a um, 30 gallon. You know, in these smaller tanks, evaporation can affect salinity uh, and dosing things can go really wrong rapidly because it's such a small body of water. Let's see. Um, let me see. That's pretty much it. <laughs> I, I don't have a lot to say on this topic. I just wanted to emphasize the planning part. Um, I kind of want to change gears and talk about something else, to be honest. <laughs> All right, let me go and see some of your comments here. I'm so glad that I was able to find you because before, I, when I ran it for like two minutes or so, the... Uh, this dog barking is distracting me. Uh, for two minutes, there was not one person. I was like, how is no one on this channel in two minutes flat? What happened? So it was weird. Hey, Steve, it's good to see you. So it's been raining in Essex. Well, it's been baking in Texas. It's uh, 108 yesterday. Today is 106 today. So it's not fun. Uh, Rev Devil says, can you please tell me how to fix a bacterial bloom in a nano reef without a UV sterilizer? My nitrates are being stripped out by the bacterial bloom and it's hurting my coral. Well, yeah, usually a UV. And because your tank is a nano, you can get a small one. Um, I don't know which one to recommend to you. I know certain ones I've heard of, but I've actually never run a UV in any of my tanks ever. But um, you could wait it out. You could add an air stone to the aquarium and then you can dose nitrate to keep your nitrates where they need to be so it doesn't, like you said, get them stripped out. But you, I mean, it can finally burn off probably in a couple of weeks. But if you're trying to get on top of it a little quicker, then yes, getting a smaller UV sterilizer rated for your size aquarium would be smart. Hey, John, nice to hear from you. He's here from England. Arthur, is here. Arthur says, hello, another cool day in Texas. It has not. Uh, Pop Reef, thank you very much for saying that. He says, your tank is looking better and better. It really has healed since your struggles. Really looking good. Thank you. Yeah, it's doing pretty decent. But um, to be honest, I'm kind of looking at it like this, you know, with one eye closed. And I'm thinking it's time to do a reset again. Dwayne is going to be here in just over a month. He's going to be helping me during Markna. He's also a guest speaker. And he said when he's not speaking with me, he's going to be in my tank working on it. So we might actually have footage of him leaning over doing things. And then when it's time for his talk, he'll have to dry off his hands and do his presentation. And then he'll get back to work and keep working on the tank because I'm going to be awake 24 hours and he's going to have plenty of time to just tinker and make it look better. But the corals at the top, the SPS corals have grown so rapidly that all the undergrowth on them is white. And uh, I feel like it's time to deal with it again. I can't believe I'm saying this. I, you know, it's so funny because in the past, when I had an aquarium, I just left it alone and it grew and grew and grew and grew and got ginormous, but it didn't need a reset. Why did it need a reset? Now I've found that like every two, two and a half, minimum, uh, maximum three years, I have to reset the reef. And I think it's because I'm more invested in SPS now than I was in the past. I had lots of LPS, I had a huge leather coral that was just growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, I had my fish, but um, I just find that I, I run out of space and it's a 400. I've, I've had this crazy, I mean, you know, I always think. I'm a big time thinker. I always have lots of stuff in my mind. I, as a matter of fact, it's, it's terrible for my sleeping <laughs> because it seems like during my sleep, I am actively dreaming or thinking through stuff and I'm exhausted when I wake up. It's kind of, kind of frustrating. But I was kind of thinking uh, recently, like in the last two days, maybe it's time to change the aquascape in my 400 gallon this time, which I've never done. Uh, one of the things when Dwayne and I were talking yesterday, he was saying, you have the perfect aquascape. We never have to touch the rock. It's always just a matter of removing the big corals and then planting new, you know, fist sized corals and let it grow in again. I said, yeah, it's funny you say that because I am thinking about possibly changing the aquascape. Now, under my aquascape in my reef, I have an, an, an entire uh, centralized acrylic support system to keep all the rocks from ever shifting. And it has worked perfectly. My aquarium is turning 10 in November 
10 years old, and the rocks have never moved in 10 years. They can't, because every single rock at the bottom has three acrylic rods that were specifically glued in the exact spot at the exact height took forever. I mean, I think it took between 12 and 15 hours to do the support system for all the rock, and I was so sick of it at the end. I was like, oh my God, I will never do this again. But I knew it was worth it, and it totally was, because I've never had any shifting. I've never had anything try to fall, because it can't. All the bottom ones are basically bolted to the bottom of the tank, you know, with that support system. And then I poured in the sand to hide it so you can't see the acrylic rods. And then I have more rock on top of it. And even those, I used the uh, cement stuff to bond them. And then the upper ones, the very top ones, they are sitting in those perfect notches where they don't budge. And then the corals, of course, grow and hold on to stuff. And it pulls it all together. So if something like an uh, army of cucumbers was moving sand, which they have done in the past, it didn't affect anything with the aquascape. So... Now I'm thinking maybe change Aquascape to put it more toward the back of the aquarium so that way the tank feels deeper because it's, you know, behind me, the tank behind me right now is 36 inches front to back. But when you look at it, it looks like an 18 inch tank because all that livestock's right here instead of being further away. And so I'm thinking if I were to do a different scape and get the rock work toward the back wall, I'd have this depth that you could really appreciate. But instead, what I've always had for the last 10 years, no, since 2011, so 12 years, I've had peninsula style. The rock where it goes through the center of the tank, it, it's in horseshoe shapes and it built up, up high on one end and down low at the other so that you could have the nice view from the short end all the way to the tall end. That was all intentional. But I, um, it's peninsula style, so the water can flow around the entire reef in a circle, and the fish can swim in an entire circle, like Spock. And they have the ability to go everywhere, where if I had all the rock against the back wall, all the fish would have to swim in the front. So there are some perks to changing the aquascape. Now here's the thing, um, and this was some of the, th you know, the things that Dwayne was telling me. He's like, well, we want to be careful not to damage the back wall of the tank, because if you end up hating it, and you want to go back to your system that you've always had, we don't want to scratch the back glass, which is Starfire. And I was like, yeah, that's true. Um, and so then I was thinking, what if <laughs> the rocks that are near the back glass, you know, the ones that are stacking upward, what if I were to mark each rock where, it, where it's going to be contact near the glass and drill the back of the rock with a hole that's quarter inch and then put in those thumb screws like we use for calcium reactors and uh, bio pellet reactors and... Uh, carbon reactors, you know, those thumb screws, and put them into the hole so you have a little plastic knurled nut touching the back glass at all those points. And if the rocks shifted a little bit or whatever, it'd be the plastic against the glass, not the rock going and tearing up the glass. The other choice would be to apply a sheet of acrylic on the back of the tank that's clear that would be my safety that if the rock were trying to shift or fall, it would scratch the acrylic, which I can just lift out later and throw away and have my perfect glass on the back of the aquarium. So, you know, these are these weird thoughts. Like I said, I'm always thinking, <laughs> always thinking. And uh, sometimes it's, it can be a little bit of a limiter because it slows me down because I'm trying to flesh things out. So let's talk about, um, first I want to discuss the rock and a barrel thing because I think it's an important one a lot of you guys are missing out on. Number one, you're missing out on live rock, okay? So let's just pretend you had live rock and you like it. <laughs> now, let's talk about what to do with that rock. You're taking rock out of a big tank, like I said earlier, the 90-gallon aquarium. You set up this 40-gallon temporary tank. You don't have room for all the rock. So putting the rock in a bin, you know, like a Rubbermaid bin, a Rubbermaid trough, a... Uh, uh, blue barrel, buckets, whatever, you know, ideally one container that holds all the rock. And then a big pump, a big mag pump, a big CJ pump. I like the mag pump for this because while it does use more power, it adds heat to the water to keep that water somewhere around 70 degrees. Maybe it's as low as 68, but that's not cold enough to lose the bacteria on the rock. So keeping the water at the right temperature, having a big circulation pump so the water's just churning in the barrel and not just kind of like moving a little tiny bit. We don't want to look like a, a docile lake. We want ocean water. So you put in a big pump, you put all your rock in there, and or you, know, or you put all the rock and then you find a way to jam that pump in there and let it circulate and let the pump heat the water a little bit. 
Now, if you don't want to do that, you can actually put a heater in there with a the rock and of course, a, like a DC driven pump, like a, a CJ, and use that to circulate the water. But you want a decent one that has good flow and maintain the water temperature and then put a lid on top. If you use a, a 33 gallon trash can, they usually come with a domed lid. You can take the lid, flip it upside down and let the dome face down and all the condensation that rises will drip down and you won't even, have to, you won't even need to top off your, uh, your, your barrel of live rock. You can just let it circulate. And then if you want, if you want to go to this process, um, there's something that I haven't heard people talk about in forever. It's called, yeah, it's called cooking live rock. I want to make sure I was saying this correctly. So cooking live rock does not mean putting on a stove or in an oven or in a barbecue or anything nutty like that. It just meant a way to clean the rock and it just was given that name. So we, we could say in 2023, rejuvenate your live rock. So what you can do, you've got your 33 gallon trash can, it's 50% full of rock. You've got the circulation, you've maintained temperature, you've had the dome on top. And then after a week or two, you can take the rock inside the barrel of salt water and you can take one in your hands and just shake it like crazy underwater. Just shake, 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 shake. And you're gonna have all this stuff come out of the rock, all this detritus. The water's gonna get a little bit, a little bit cloudy, right? And take that clean rock and put it inside another 33 gallon barrel of salt water and do the next rock, shake it like crazy, put it in the barrel and keep doing this until you've moved all your rock over. Then move your pump over, move your heater over, put your dome back on top, you know, your lid and let it continue to run for like a week or so. And then dump out the first trash can of that dirty brown water. A week later, set up a new, you know, the other trash can emptied out, fill it up with salt water, shake it off again. And if you do this for like six or eight weeks in a row, and you don't have to do it every week if you don't want to, but if you're really trying to knock this out and make your rock nice and clean and pure, so it's ready for the new setup, if you did it weekly, that's not bad because think about it, you're shaking off the detritus and you're using new salt water. So the, the rock is getting a water change every single week. And by the end of eight weeks, you'll have really clean rock and you'll, everything that was alive on it will still be alive. And just because you didn't have light on it, doesn't mean anything bad has happened to it. And you know what? People might say, well, what about the coralline? What about, you know, uh, sponges? The sponges don't care about light at all. Almost never do sponges care about light. They are filter feeders. And I had a barrel sitting in the back room um, of this house for nine months, 15 months, I don't know. Every once in a while, <laughs> and that barrel didn't even have the dome lid because I got rid of those trash cans. I got one of those big blue, uh, dense barrels. It's got that really hard plastic. And uh, it was just open and sitting in the corner, just circulating. And every once in a while, I'd remember to go in there and, and dump in like five gallons of RODI water to bring the water level up because the salinity was uh, rising because of evaporation. But I would take rock out and it was just covered in yellow sponge. And I love yellow sponge. I think it's beautiful. Some people hate that stuff. I think it's fantastic. And if the rock loses some of that vivid purple color, uh, coralline color, that's okay because it will come back. And those of you that are used to setting up tanks with dry rock, you're used to looking at white rock anyway, so why would you care? <laughs> you're like, I don't care, I love white rock. No, uh, it, it's not white, but it could be pale. Now, if you wanted to, after you've done the cooking of the live rock and you've got it nice and pure, at that point, you could put some kind of light over it, but then, you know, basically every so many days, you're gonna have to like turn the rock and kind of flip them over and move the water ones to the top. And it's kind of going to be kind of hard to light them to get anything going. So really, we just want to have nice, healthy, clean, detritus free rock you can put in your new setup. And then of course, in time, it will get the beautiful colors you like. If there was any aptasia on it, you can kill them in that barrel. Um, they will turn clear because they are getting no light whatsoever. And uh, if you want, you can scrape them off as you find them. They may try to work their way to the top. If there's any other pests on that rock, uh, like Mahanos or I don't know, some, let's say you had a, a mantis shrimp or something, you might get lucky and it, it might um, end up at the bottom of the barrel when you've moved all your rock over and you just kind of remove the pest. So, I mean, there's really good benefits to keeping your rock circulating in water. And someone recently, about a week ago, was saying in Club Mila's Reef, that they've had a bunch of dry aquarium rock that they want to use and what would be the right approach. I said, get it into saltwater immediately. If they'd had it in saltwater the whole time, that 
rock would have been completely safe to use. But at this point, because it was dried out, it's actually toxic rock <laughs> initially. So by putting in salt water, the outside is whatever it is. It's what's in the core of the rock. Like if you could take the rock and break it off in, inside, I would imagine you could see damp areas in the middle of the rock and see if you would just take that rock that was dry sitting in the garage, it's been in a hundred degree weather, right? And you're like, I'm putting it in my tank because it's dry. There's nothing on it. It's totally safe. No, it's not. Because when you put it in and all the water works its way through all the pores of the rock, that stuff in the center that was moist, that was anoxic, will release all kinds of chaos into your reef and it'll actually affect things adversely. And you may see uh, corals having issues. You may see fish aren't doing well. And it's because that rock came in from outside. And I'm not speaking of this uh, without personal knowledge. I have literally taken a rock that was outside and put it in my 280 gallon reef because I needed one more rock to hold something up. And it was just sitting outside. It was in the spot where it couldn't get rained on. It was under a trailer, <laughs> just sitting out there for months and months and months. And I was like, ah, okay. And I could just see the tank didn't look well for about a week or two. It, something in that rock was not right. So I should, and that's when I learned, I got to make sure I keep these dry rocks in water circulating and get them operational. Because it was a rock I used to use and I didn't need, and it was sitting outside, and I thought, okay, well, I do need it now to hold up this one thing, and it was a mistake. So I'm, I'm giving you this advice based on personal experience. It's not just me coming up with some crazy theory and some strange recommendation that has no basis whatsoever. Um, Want to be smart. So if you do have rock right now, I would suggest getting into a barrel and just let it idly sit there for months on end. And if you want to do the cooking thing and, you know, really shake it out and change the water frequently and, and do that, it can remove detritus, it can lower phosphate, it can uh, allow you to find whatever's on there that's, a you know, an annoyance. But it won't have things like green hair algae. It won't have things like cyanobacteria. None of that's going to happen in the barrel. So then when you want to use it, because it's been sitting there idling for months on end, weeks, weeks, minimum, months preferably, then when you need to use it, you can put it in the tank and use it immediately and nothing, no cycle, no weirdness. Just grab the rock, put it in the tank, start stacking it up, make it pretty. You know, obviously you're gonna have your salt water rising as you're putting rock in there. You're gonna have to adjust for uh, the uh, displacement, but uh, you'll be able to have livestock in that tank because the rock is ready. It's not dry rock starting to get bacteria. It is rock covered in bacteria that's just been waiting. and. Even if it's not a lot of bacteria, because I don't know how much there is. Now, let's just say there's a thousand bacteria on that rock, which is ridiculous. It would be way more. Even in a spot where I'm not feeding it, I'm not giving anything, bacteria continues to live on the surface of the rock. And when you put it into that reef tank and you get it going and you've got your lights going and you're putting in a fish or two or you're putting in a few corals, that bacteria will just boom. And it'll take off like COVID. <laughs> And you'll have tons of bacteria. It will exponentially grow until it gets to its next limiting point, and that will be the size it is. So I would highly recommend not having dry rock sit in a barrel or in a uh, cooler, you know, like an ice chest, ice chest or something. Just get it in salt water and just have it sitting standing on, in standby mode for when you need to use it. Okay. Yes, we're going to leave it at that. Let's go to the next question that comes up here. Lots of nice comments. Charles says, with carbon dosing, is it better to dose all at once or spread the dose out over the entire day with a doser? I'm using Nopox and I'm curious about best practices. Well, listen, I can tell you all about Nopox because I fought that stuff for nine months. The one thing for best practices is to wet skim. So if you're using Nopox, let your skimmer cup fill up with liquid daily and dump that out. That was the one thing I didn't do. And it was actually something recommended to me by Red Sea when I contacted tech support for help because I could not get it. It was not touching my nitrate. It would not bring them down, okay? And I was putting in less than the recommended dose. I was putting, I was required based on water volume, I should use 54 milliliters a day. And I used a dosing pump to trickle in 45 milliliters a day. And I did this, I bought three, four, five bottles of Nopox and I had it on a doser and I let it go in once a day and I had this pink webbing goo everywhere in my system. Inside the Vortec cages, 
inside the refugium, around the protein skimmer. It looked like pink Halloween webs inside my return zone, going from the return pump to the strainer basket of the closed loop. I would take a fishnet and I would scoop back and forth constantly trying to catch all this stuff off, taking the strainer off carefully and rinsing it off in the sink to get all that crap out of the system. And it was awful how much of that happened. And the funny thing is my tank sitter, Bobby, has used no pox and swears by it. He says, this is fantastic. It brings them down. And uh, I said, man, I don't know what's going on, but it is not, my nitrates are always at 80. They never come down. And uh, I'm getting this pink goo. He goes, that's really weird. And I was like, I don't know what to tell you. And so I, that's when I reached out to Red Sea. I said, can you explain to me what I'm doing wrong? And they said, well, you got to use the right dose. I'm like, I'm using less than you recommend. And it's a nightmare. If I were to add 10 more milliliters, you know, to hit that number, I would have had 10 times more of that pink stuff. That was for sure. Now, here's the funny thing. Um, someone else was using Nopox had the same red stuff. And uh, so I, or pink stuff. And I said, yeah, I, I know what that is. But then Bobby had to buy a new bottle at one point and he got the pink stuff all inside his sump. He'd never seen it before. He says, how on earth did that happen? And he says, I think they changed the recipe, which maybe they did. Or maybe the bottle, the bottles I got or the, this new batch was slightly different than what it was in the previous times because it worked perfectly for Bobby with no incident, no weirdness, no pink webbing. <laughs> so I, um, I can just tell you that you don't want to overdose it and you definitely want to wet skim because I was dry skimming. I was pulling out, you know, a little tiny bit of skim made per day because I was just used to how I skim. I never even knew that it had to be wetter skimming for Nopox to be effective. And so that's the only thing that I didn't do that could possibly make it work for you. But I don't think you need to dose it throughout the day. Now, if you had to put in 50 milliliters a day, you could put in 10 milliliters an hour for five hours if you want to do that. But I think just getting it in there daily is all that matters because not everyone has a dosing pump. And I guarantee you the typical hobbyist will not sit there and grab their bottle of something and take it and pour in the day's batch into a little specimen cup and then pour in a few drops every hour all day long. They're going to put in what they need to put in, dump it in and be done. So using a dosing pump is already slower than if we were to put it in manually. So I would say that once a day just putting the right amount in is totally fine. I don't think you need to spread it out all day long. Nick says, is it normal to have to dose 179 milliliters of magnesium a day into our 180 gallon? It seems like a lot for not having any SPS or Montes. We don't need to dose any calcium. The alkalinity is at 45 milliliters per day. Okay, so let's talk about magnesium because that's a good one uh, to discuss. Magnesium, there's a thing called the Reef Chemistry Calculator. If you type that into Google, it'll take you to JDX Calculator. And that thing will let you put in your tank size, which you said is 180 gallon, and your water volume might actually be 160 gallons. I don't know. Maybe it's 180 because you have a big sump underneath. But it's not 180 gallon plus 40 gallon sump, and that puts you at 220. That's not what you have. Because sand, displacement of rock, and then of course, the water is inside the aquarium. It's not to the outside of the plastic trim and everything. That is the 180 gallon dimension, six by two by two. And the inside is low less. It's uh, 71 and a quarter by 23 and a half by maybe 21 inches of water. And so you do the math like, oh, it's 160 gallons. <laughs> so anyway. Let's just say your, your number, your true water volume is 160 gallons. You put that in the top calculator uh, to show your tank size. And then you put in your current magnesium level, what it's measuring in your tank. And then you put in what you want it to be. And then you go to the magnesium uh, list and you pick which type of magnesium you're adding to the tank. It could be Randy's uh, part, I think it's two part A or two part B. I mean, you'll just find the magnesium that matches what you're using. And you'll say how much you need to put in total to bring that number up. So let's say you're at 1300 and you want to be at 1400. And you put it in the calculator, it spits out the result that you need um, 1200 milliliters of magnesium. And you're like, wow, okay. So you could tell your doser 1200 divided by seven. That's how much I'm going to put in a day, which would probably be I don't know, 150 milliliters a day. 
And then after a week, you wanna see if your number came to 1400. You do your test and you see. And if you're at 1380, you're like, hey, it pretty much was right. Now, you don't need to keep putting in 150 milliliters a day from then on. You, once you hit your, norm, your, your desired level, it tends to stay there a good long time. But to get there could take a while. And that kind of thing, that's, it takes a lot of magnesium to bring magnesium up. Just like it takes a lot of molybdenum, um, manganese, to make manganese even appear on an ICP test. You have to put in so much. It just never wants to show up. It's crazy how much I put in my tank. But yeah, it takes a lot. And I remember back when I had my 280, I was mixing, I was making my own magnesium with a uh, mag flake and I'd make two liter bottles and I'd just pour the bottle into the sump. Blah, 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 blah. Two liters worth. <laughs> and then that would, you know, no dosing pumps back then. And I would just pour that in and then I'd do another two liters like a few days later. And that was basically well, four liters. That's basically a gallon of water of uh, magnesium I dumped in the tank and it would get my number back where it needed to be. So. It can take a lot, but then once it's there, then you're going to want to taper it back. So if my tank suddenly had a low magnesium level, I would put in like 99 milliliters a day in my 450 gallon system. And I would let that do it until the jug was empty and then I would measure it. And then if it was pretty much where I like it to be, then I'd probably reduce it to maybe 60 milliliters a day to maintain. So that's why that's the long answer to your question. Also, where you're dosing the magnesium matters, it should be in an area of high flow. So if you're using a dosing pump to put it in, that's fine, but you need a power head underneath the area where the liquid is dripping in to just mix it into the water column. And if you're doing that, you'll have much more success than having it just drip, drip, drip into a low flow area because it'll just kind of, it'll look like oil and water if you look really, really closely with the flashlight, you can see it'll like doink, doink, doink and you'll see it's kind of cloudy-ish and it could just settle down and just calcify basically on the bottom of the sump and you're not getting the benefits of the magnesium. Uh, Reggie says, I just used citric acid on some dry rock. Do you think it's okay to use in my tank? Back to my whole rock discussion, I would say that you need to put it in salt water for a few weeks and change the water a couple of times and then it'll be okay to put in your tank. Trevor says that Jack can bark all she wants. I just don't know how loud it's coming through for you guys. I answered that. Tammy's causing trouble. Tammy says I should come help tear down these tanks and move them. Where? Where are you going to move them to? I don't know anything. You need to update me, Tammy. Uh, Hillbilly Reefer says, uh, I have two questions. Is there a reef safe treatment that can be used around my aquarium? And also, uh, you mentioned two similar products for Reef Health. There's Reef Hance and Live Rock Enhance. Those two are made by uh, Reef Bright. And one is a type of food to encourage growing more pods in your aquarium. And the other is to help clean the decay off the rock in the system. By the way, in the whole rock cooking thing, you could be using Live Rock Enhance in there. It totally works. And if you're starting a new tank with dry rock, you could use Live Rock Enhance to get some bacteria from that stuff into your dry rock. So it's another reef safe item. Now to treat for fleas, if you're talking about some kind of a fogger that you gotta use in the room, you're gonna have to tarp off your aquarium completely. And I would take an air pump and put it, unfortunately, you put it outside, it's so hot right now, right? But put the air pump outside with a you know, hose going into the aquarium to pump clean air from outside into the tank during the treatment of the fleas. And that way, if you're fogging a room to kill insects of any kind, whether it's roaches or fleas or, or I don't know, what other kind of bugs you could have, and you need to fog the house, if you had to tent it, you know, you want to completely, you, it's called um, positive pressure. So you completely wrap the tank with like uh, a drop cloth, you know, some kind of a, a plastic drop cloth, and you tape it so it's completely sealed, turn off the protein skimmer, add the air stone into the tank with the air pump sitting outside, pushing fresh air inside your 
taped bubble of plastic around the aquarium. And that will allow you to do what you gotta do with the house. And then when it's all done, you've aired the house out, you can then strip off the plastic. You can go ahead and remove the air pump, it's done, and you can get the skimmer going again. But that is the safest way to protect your livestock during that kind of treatment. If you're talking about something else that you sprinkle on the carpet to kill fleas, because I haven't had to deal with that in forever, um, I know the stuff you can just shake out. It sort of looks like baking soda, and then you would vacuum. But the vacuum cleaner kind of aerosolizes all that stuff. So there's a chance maybe it would be in the air and the protein skimmer could kind of suck it in. So, but I'm talking about when you're treating, when you're fogging your room, that's when you would do that. Um, Trevor says, does anyone have a trick for dealing with the coral boring spionid worms? They are annoying little vermited like worms with two antennas that stick out of SPS corals. You could just close the hole with some super glue gel. Um, that would be one method. I've had those things just poking out of the sand bed and had their little tentacles out. And I just, I thought they were awesome. <laughs> I put a picture of them on creature ID and that was it. I, I never ever had to worry about them or, or feel, I mean, I have a big problem with vermitids in my reef because I ignored them way too long. And I'm going to have to, at some point, go in and just systematically remove them. I was trying to take some pictures recently. Here, I'll show you guys uh, a photo or two that I uh, sent over to another company recently. They're, they are going to use it in their advertising. And I think it was this one. This one. All right, so I'll put it on the screen, full screen. So this beautiful A-can... There's a big web right there going up. That was from a stupid vermitid that was about four inches to the uh, to the right of it. And the flow was pushing the web against it and it was ruining my shot. I was like, get out of the picture. But it was right there. <laughs> I was like, you dumb thing. And I wanted to just like turkey baste it away. But then of course the coral closed up and, and, and then it was unphoto unphotographable. So that was annoying. Let's see if I have another pretty picture to show you. Here, I'll show you guys something fun. So this is a monastria, I think. And it had these sweeper or feeding tentacles out. It's really pretty. So I shared that. I'm going to be moving this guy to the front of my reef pretty soon. I, I'm tired of having to visit it in the back. And my uh, pectinia has been doing quite well. So it's not huge or anything, but it's very happy and very pretty. And then here is a recent shot of the area that you're seeing on the right side of the video. So this was taken uh, two nights ago. And you can see a lot of the skunk clowns and some anemone tentacles and the hammer coral and the SPS and the beautiful yellow tang. I mean, it's all doing pretty well, but it, you know, there's always room for improvement. And here's something that you guys only see from a distance and usually I'm in the way so you can't. This is lithophylon, and each of these has a mouth right there. And it's a very slow grower, and it's awesome. And I've had mine for probably 12, if not 15 years. And um, it's probably the size of a dessert plate right now. Like I said, slow grower. What else? Anything else? How about a couple of branches of the pearlberry? So that's a coral that is in the middle of my reef. It's doing pretty well, but it's nothing ginormous to write home about. But it's been, uh, I mean, you can see the branches are growing two different directions there. <laughs> so that means the base has to be big enough to be able to do that, right? Okay, let's go to the next question. Hillbilly Reefer says, very excited to see a tank reef set. Uh, I hope you go live for it or at least extended video of the process. It's loads of fun to watch. It's a very slow process. I mean, it, it takes all day. And when we did it last time, we basically, <laughs> we did it over th a three day period. We did a piece at a time instead of just trying to do it because it's 400 gallons. It's a big footprint, seven feet by three feet, that whole thing. And you know, it's not just a matter of plucking something out and plunking something down. It, there's always, you know, effort involved in cleaning up the parts, but it's uh, definitely on my list. Yeah, thank you, Tammy. The nylon thumb screws. I was thinking if those were poking out the back of the rock or, 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 or glued into the back of the rock, then if there's some shifting, it's just nylon against glass. 
Kevin says, is it okay to add salt after filling your tank with RO water? Basically skipping the pre-mix step. People have done that. Um, people like to mix the water in their aquarium. I choose to mix it in a trash can where it's easier for me to measure it and verify it and then pump it into the tank. And I remember when I got my 400 gallon and I set it up, um, my dad was very interested in what I was doing. And he said, did you water test the aquarium? I was like, no. He said, shouldn't you do that? I was like, why would I do that? <laughs> it's brand new. Of course it's going to hold water. And um, it was just funny to me that he thought I should check it. I mean, it, it kind of makes sense, but I would have had to pump some kind of water in there, like 400 gallons of water, and then waste 400 gallons of water. I didn't see why I needed to do that. So when I set up my 400 and did all my plumbing, which by the way, the plumbing took three days also to do the drain assembly, to do the return assembly, and then to do the closed loop, uh, no, sorry, uh, the, uh, the manifold assembly, those took hours and hours to do. So I didn't try to do it all in one day. I would have hated my life if I had done it all in one day. But instead, I would do it a section at a time. And then when everything was done, then I would go ahead and I did my uh, sand and my rock works that I described earlier. And then I'd add water and I'd add salt water. <laughs> That's what I did. And uh, it worked perfectly. And there was no leak for 13 months. And then it leaked. But, you know, so if I had done the 400 gallon test when I first got it with tap water or garden hose, it probably wouldn't have leaked but it definitely did after 13 months. Now the new one, when I got that and put it into place, I did the same thing. I filled it up and I used it. I did not do a test. I'm just assuming that if they do a good job and they build the aquarium, it's gonna hold water. <laughs> it would be really weird to put a brand new tank on a stand and add water and just start leaking immediately. I mean, that's just, that's, I, my brain couldn't even accept that. I don't know. It, Everything else we buy just works, you know, because it's new. So I would just say it works. <laughs> um, so, Kevin, back to your question again. I'll throw it on the screen one more time. Is it okay to add salt? Yes, it is. But then when you start adding sand or rock to your tank, you're going to be throwing away some salt water because of displacement. So that's why I, I would prefer to mix it in something where I can reach and I can scoop out some water. I mean, obviously, you can do all of that in the tank. You could scoop out water to measure the salinity with a hydrometer or with a refractometer or whatever device you want to use. And then, like I said, then, but you're going to be putting everything into a tank full of water where if you're trying to, you know, work with your rock and I don't know, build it up into a thing and you're trying to make a certain shape, it's a lot easier when the tank isn't full to the top with water. If it's only like 50% or th if it's a third of the tank is filled with water and you're mounting your rock and putting that cement stuff to hold the rock together, for example, then, you know, after a few hours it's dry, then you add some more water, you know, you can kind of work it up and then you're just planting corals. I don't know. That's, that's why I do it the way I do it. But yes, you can just do it in the tank if that's what you'd prefer to do that. Brett's Reef says, what app do you use for your testing results? I use Reef Trace. That's got to be here somewhere. Here it is. So this is the app that I use. It is for iOS and for Android. And no, this is not a paid endorsement. <laughs> Reef Trace is an app I'm a partner in. You'll see a lot of my, my name appears in there quite a bit. Uh, the Creature ID was a, con a big contribution for me and then they fleshed it out, made it even better. Um, the water parameters, their goal was to make it where you could track your stuff and it saves all the data to the cloud so you never lose it. And um, it's super easy to use. I um, have been promising for some time that I'm going to create some kind of a video explaining how to use the thing. And I need to do it. And I just need some time. I've been uh, busy with some other projects and I just I got to find some time to make that happen. But the Reef Trace app is super easy to use. And like I said, you can uh, find it for either platform of phones. Jason Langer is here. Oh, the, he only said hi to Tammy. Never mind. Let's see. Uh, Thomas says the salinity in my tank is 1.024 and the new salt water is 1.027. I added RODI to see if that would bring it down and I tested it again. It's still 1.027. So the new salt water is too salty. You're going to have to add more RO water to it or even take some salt water out, throw it away and put some RO water in to get the salinity back to the correct number.
Mackenzie says, your tank looks great. I'm going from a Fowler to a softy tank. And if you don't know what Fowler is, it's fish only with live rock. I just replaced old lights with a couple of XR15s. What intensity would you recommend? Well, it's, uh, it's new lighting. It's, you went, I thought I saw, I don't know what the old lights were. You know, were they T5s? Were they also LED? I don't know. But it's pretty much a safe bet to run your lights at a maximum of 50% initially as you're getting used to the schedule. And then, you know, you could bring it up a little bit higher if you feel the need to get that sweet look. But your softies are not light demanding like LPS and SPS corals. So you don't have to go full tilt. Um, and because it's the XR15, you know, the Radeon, you can adjust the colors to find that sweet spot that you prefer to get some nice glow on certain things. The greener corals will glow under blue lighting, but then um, you use more white and you can really appreciate the beauty of the soft corals. Tammy switched from her phone to TV and now I'm life size. Life size. <laughs> Let's see. By the way, um, I double checked and last week, so <laughs> as of last week, we've had 251 live streams. So today makes 252 live streams since 2016. That is a lot of live streams. And I was, uh, I'm kind of con trying to consider what to do about that. Do we want to keep doing these live streams every Saturday or is it time to do something different on this channel? So if you have an opinion, now is your time to voice it because my brain is spinning. <laughs> I got things in my mind and I don't know. It might be time to just start doing a weekly video instead, instead of doing a live stream. You wouldn't have the interaction with me like you do now with the chat. Um, but I'm curious to hear your feelings on that. So feel free to let me know. Tammy, uh, the chalice you brought is doing well. It, um, an anemone tried to sting part of it, but I moved it into a safer spot. And I, other than that, it's doing well. John says, it doesn't seem like you have high flow for a gorgeous reef tank, <laughs> especially with that many SPS. Well, uh, there's two MP60s on the left end of the tank, the way you're looking at it now. And then there are two um, random flow accelerators that increase the velocity of the water coming from the return pump, which is running at 85%. And to be honest, there's a lot of flow in there. And if you put your hand in there, you can, you can feel it. And if you look at corals that can move, you can see how they move. Now, obviously, like where the anemones are, that's kind of in a dead spot. That's intentional. I don't want the anemone to walk. <laughs> I want it to be in an area where it's very low flow. There's a huge hammer coral, and the hammer coral is doing this all the time. And then, you know, you look at the polyps on the SPS. Like, when I try to take pictures of them, they're kind of closed. They're not wide open like you see in those pictures of corals that are for sale. And you're like, wow, that thing is so fluffy. Mine are never fluffy because they're getting pummeled with water. So I don't know. I mean, there's always room to put more flow, but then I got to add a pump somewhere that is now going to be in my line of sight that's going to irritate me. So I, I don't think I need it. And based on the quickness of the coral growth in my tank, I think I have adequate flow. It's, just, it's very hard to see with SPS. You don't see flow with, with hard corals. You know, the small pull-up stonies are stonies. <laughs> but if you had torches in there, I wonder how they'd look with my flow. Um, Mike says, what is your approximate lead time for a custom overflow box? I need to get one for my 310 gallon. I can get you the dimensions, no big rush. Tank won't be set up until the end of the year. Uh, probably four weeks at the most, six. Just depends on uh, current load. Uh, we've got Markna coming up in like 34 days. I'm gonna be very busy preparing for that. And um, I've got uh, Restock Chattanooga that's going to happen in about three weeks. I have to leave for three days for that. And uh, I've got a couple things I have to do with the house before all the guests show up from Markna <laughs> because there are going to be people here with me. It's going to be great. And so I kind of want things to look right. And so I've got that going on and I'm taking care of customer orders. I shipped out some stuff this week to some people and they had about a four week wait. So I'd say four to six weeks sounds reasonable to me. And uh, yeah, send me those dimensions. I'll make you what you need and ship it to you and you can get it set up. 
Uh, Nick says, what are your thoughts on the Mahano wand or lasers? Seems like too many in our tank to use Ephatasia. I've used lasers. It does work. Um, you, you have to cook them, <laughs> but it's Mahanos. Mahanos are more dense than Aptasia. And uh, I have some in my tank, but you know, I mean, I have too many in my tank. I, I had a handful, like maybe six, and now there's probably 30. And I need to go in there, and some are big and beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is bigger round. And I need to go ahead and just hit them with Ephaptasia. That's what I'm going to do. Now, the thing about Mahanos, there are some other techniques. If you want, it's kind of a, a, a rush from the kitchen to the tank back and forth. But you can get some boiling water, and you can fill a syringe with boiling water and run to the tank and inject the Mahano, and it will turn into like a, like a Pixar balloon looking thing. And then you can kind of plop it right off the rock work. Mahanos come off the rock a lot easier than Aptasia, so you can just work them off by scraping them off. That's another option. But uh, I don't know that the Mahano wand is going to please you. It just depends how much working space you have in the aquarium. You know, if you have a lot of corals in the way, the wand is a long stick, and getting the wand in there to hit that spot without breaking corals that are above it, you know, can sometimes be tricky. I had one for a while. I used it. It, it just seemed kind of okay to me, and it kind of worked. I, I wasn't, like, I never thought it was a piece of crap. <laughs> it, it definitely did work, but it was another one of those painstaking things, and maybe it's just harder for me because my tank is big. And, you know, when you've got a tank that's 30 inches tall, it's kind of hard to do some of these things, and uh, trying to get that wand in the right spot and get the right angle and look at it, and you're holding it, and you're trying to zap it, and you're trying to burn away and melt and you know you're doing that then you go to the next spot and you're trying to still make sure you get rid of all the first one it's just kind of everything's effort there's nothing easy about getting rid of those things that's why we try so hard not to let them get in in the first place tammy i don't hoard the cookies i'm preserving them so that way if anything ever happens to jason i can say this is what jason made diego La laguna marin is here from spain <laughs> a Molly Miller Blenny eats Mahanos, John? I haven't heard of that. John asked, have you managed to get any of the YouTubers like Reef Dork or Prestige Reef from Markna yet? I'm actually not looking for YouTubers necessarily. I saw your, your uh, recommendation in my email. I didn't ignore it. And I haven't ruled it out either because the benefit is they're from overseas, which would be a better time zone. So I might do it. But right now I'm still fleshing out uh, different people in the industry to be speakers. And uh, we've, I've got room for about eight more people. So... That's what's going to be happening the next couple of weeks is locking in the last of the speakers. And it could be that I'll end up bringing in a couple of YouTubers. We'll see. But thank you very much for asking and for recommending. Trevor says, if you did it again, what's the max height tank you would get? 30 inches sounds too tall. Well, I love 30 inches. It's just a pain. You get water up to your armpit. <laughs> just do. Uh, so having uh, like the long tongs, to reach in and get things, uh, to have a long acrylic rod where I can kind of do things from above and just kind of do that is fine. Sometimes I like work in the tank when I've done somewhat of a water change and lower the water level in the tank about this much. To, you take away six inches of water, it just seems easier to work a little bit lower because you only get the water up to the top of your elbow basically and you can kind of do what you got to do. But when the tank is filled, it, it does feel kind of a little bit more ominous. But then when you have a tank that's only 24 inches tall, it just seems too short because you have to have your livestock low enough to have flow across the top and as soon as they they breach that height you know because a 24 inch tank is probably more like 20 inches realistic real estate vertically speaking where a 30 inch tank is more like 24 to 26 inches of water so vertically so it's it 30 is a good height it looks good and uh it just depends on the entire room and it depends on the tank itself you know the shape of the tank you know one of the things that i don't like is when you see a lot of woodwork coming up and you see a lot of woodwork above it like it's all built in and you have this sliver of a tank <laughs> it just kind of seems strange to me but i mean sometimes they can pull it off sometimes a sliver can look really cool if it's if the right livestock is put in there like if you had a fungia farm 
<laughs> then a sliver would be perfect. And a bunch of sun corals in the background for uh, contrasting color. That'd be amazing. Somebody make that. That would be, I'd love to see that. Mm, let's see. All right. Um, let me, oops, keep doing that. I'm surprised this window does not want to let me move it anywhere. It's locked me in for some reason. Let me do a couple other things here. I want to throw this on the screen. Thank you, Fritz, for sponsoring my channel. You get a little love today. I, uh, I do appreciate that they chose me as a person to represent them. I'm going to be working on some videos with them, so you'll be seeing me on their channel soon enough. And then, of course, we'll put those videos on my channel as well about using Fritz products. So you can look forward to that. I, um, I'm using Fritz salt now, in case you didn't know. And I like it because it mixes nice and cleanly and it smells yummy. And that is something I came up with way before they sponsored me. <laughs> also, I would like to mention that, um, as before I mentioned, Markna is coming and I need you guys to tell the world. So it is happening September 9th at nine in the morning, central time in Texas. So if you are somewhere else, you need to make sure you are awake and and ready to go because we're gonna start at nine in the morning and we're gonna go all the way till nine in the morning on Sunday, September 10th. And this is going to be a blast. There's gonna be 24 different speakers. Each one is a live stream. So they're all individual. It's not one super long stream. Um, I'm not even sure how that's gonna work for you guys if you're gonna keep getting notifications with each new stream or if you're gonna to have to keep Mila's Reef on your page and as soon as a new live stream pops up, you click on it, I don't know. But uh, I'm going to have Peter Cherick here to help run the show. And he is an expert at this kind of stuff. And hopefully he will work out any of the logistics that would make it difficult for you to follow. I hope that you guys can find each stream. Maybe we'll do something creative on the, uh, the back end. I don't know. I mean, it'd be kind of cool if once the first speaker is done and we go into the little 15-minute uh, interlude which has the raffle and some other stuff during that part it would be kind of cool if the next live stream was like pasted into the end of the first stream if that makes sense <laughs> like there'd be a link you could click on i don't know if we can do it i guess it depends how youtube will save the files and uh, how soon we can hit the edit on them to put stuff but in the end we'll probably work on the end screen uh windows to give you the options to click through to the next speaker or we'll do a playlist and we'll put each one on the playlist and then maybe you can figure out where you're at on that playlist i don't know well this is going to be it's the first time it's been done no one's done it before for the saltwater hobby so we're doing it here for the first time best part is it's on youtube and it's free to attend we are going to have raffle prizes and we are um Using the raffle proceeds, the money that comes in from buying raffle tickets will go to the Coral Restoration Foundation, who are based in Florida. And those guys are currently reporting some record high temperatures that are devastating corals out there. So their, all their work of planting corals for you know, the last decade are at risk. And a lot of corals are turning white because the water is over 100 degrees. Imagine your aquarium over 100. What do you think is going to happen? Something's happening bad out there right now with this heat wave. And uh, so the question is really going to come down to, did the corals bleach but are still alive or do they bleach and they're dead? And that depends on the species. But I saw one video that uh, another Club Milo's Reef uh, <clears throat> participant shared where it showed like a finger gorgonian or something or ribbon gorgonian. And the person that was filming it he was showing how bad the skin was on there, and then he just took and shook it like this, and all the flesh just blew away. It just, it just, the whole coral had melted, and all was left was that weird, uh, like, twig inner uh, structure that holds a gorgonian together. Um, the, the life was gone, and it, the whole, the whole colony was just obliterated from this heat. So it's really sad what's happening in Florida right now, and of course other places too. But uh, that's the one I'm aware of right now. And then I've been telling you guys each week to subscribe to Coral Magazine. And I don't know if you're listening to me. <laughs> no one's told me. I don't know. Coral Magazine hasn't said, hey, we've got 50 new subscribers, Mark. Thank you. I haven't heard anything. But I'm recommending you guys get this magazine. It is such a good magazine. 
And I've been working my way through the latest, you know, the latest issues, got probably 12 or 15 articles, and I've been reading through, you know, the latest ones to, to learn, and I think you should be doing the same. So if you are not a subscriber to Coral Magazine, you should do it. Go to CoralMagazine.com and hit that subscribe button and give them, I don't know, whatever it is, 56 bucks for a year. And, I mean, it's cheaper than a frag, right? <laughs> Just get that and get some extra education because we are not live streaming seven days a week. We're only doing one show a week. So there's so many hours of the week that you are not learning and you could be learning so much more and, and you'd, you'd, you'd benefit greatly. It is such a well-written magazine that helps not just hobbyists, it helps industry people, it helps science. It covers a lot of fantastic information and a lot of effort goes into every issue. So I've been a subscriber for a decade, maybe longer. And I, I can't emphasize enough that you need to be one, too. Mm, okay, that's that. Let's go back to our questions. Adam says, I saw your nice fire pit. Have you ever considered putting a water feature outside? I've been building one for the last few weeks. It's a lot of fun. It looks great. Adam, send me pictures of your water feature. I am actually on the fence about one for some time now. Um, I have two different people that have been, they've volunteered a couple of times, said, I would love to come out and do a water feature for you, Mark, and I showed them where I want it to be. And the problem is I don't want to pay the money. <laughs> I mean, basically what they're suggesting probably will run about $10,000, and I don't want to spend $10,000 on a water feature. It might be worth $10,000. I might love it, but I'll be mad at myself for spending ten grand on this thing outside. So... I'm trying different ideas. And one of the things I've considered was a pondless pond. So basically you have water that flows into what looks like rocks and the filtration's underneath where it just goes into basically a sump that's hidden under the rocks and pumps back up and you just have this flowing thing. I've considered that. There's this one thing I really like. It looks like a giant orb with this kind of like, it looks like stacked slices of rock. It's really neat looking. And I was thinking, man, I could put that in the back corner uh, behind the fire pit area and it would just be there, just trickling water quietly and it would be a nice little feature and probably wouldn't cost $10,000. And then I was just uh, discussing this with a friend saying I was considering what if I were to get those big whiskey barrels, you know, the big ones that have the bands around them and they got the planks coming up, you know, and if I could get different, like three different sizes and I could have the biggest one at the bottom and then build the second one into the, the bigger one and then put the smallest one so it kind of like tears down and the bottom would be basically the sump, right? And the top, the water would flow up and go barrel to barrel to barrel. I think that might look good in that corner. It, it, it might be rustic enough and match the fence, the rock work, the lighting. It might be nice and probably wouldn't be a thousand dollars. I don't know. I don't know what those things cost. I have no idea. But I was thinking maybe I could make that, you know, because I think I'd, I don't think I can like buy it like that. And I don't want to buy something plasticky. You know, I've seen stuff where it looks like rock, but it's just a big fiberglass thing you just shove in the corner and it just kind of looks like, ugh, I don't like that. So I thought if I were to do this tier thing, I would actually have to cut the barrel and then mount the barrel and then seal the barrel <laughs> so that everything works with a stair step and it would look nice. And plus, because it would be sitting on top of the ground and not down, uh, digging down into the earth, it doesn't affect any kind of uh, utilities. I wouldn't have to worry about the city saying you're on some easement or something like that because I wouldn't put it that far back. Uh, it might be a nice place to have water. And then, of course, I'd be a spot where Jack could go out and get some fresh water when she's out there baking in the sun. She can go lick it. Uh, I was asking some people that own ponds, and I said to them, uh, what do you do about, you know, water discoloring, or, you know, what about algaes and stuff like that? And it seems like you can do stuff that uh, keeps the water looking nice, and yet still is safe for the dog to, to drink, and other animals. So we'll see. But yeah, I've been considering it for the last year. Tammy is worried that she's going to win all the raffles and then get banned. I wouldn't ban you, Tammy. I would just ship all your stuff to Andrea and give her the prizes. Oh, let's see. 
All right, Thomas, well, that was good news. See, now you're much closer to 1.024. You can go ahead and do that water change. Oh, perfect, Adam. I want to see that. So, yeah, post it in the group. Tag me. Oh, good. Mackenzie says that they sell those barrels at Home Depot. <laughs> All right. How are we doing on time? We should wrap this up. Let's jump to this one. So it's water test Saturday. Please do test your water. It's so important. It keeps your livestock healthy and happy. And if you know what your water parameters are, you can make the slight adjustments to keep them where they need to be. And if anything's lacking, you can make the correction now, not a few weeks from now when something's dying and you're like, well, what's wrong? Let me test my water. Don't wait. Test your water weekly. It's the smartest thing you can possibly do. All the public aquariums you visit when you choose to go there, they test every single day. I'm only asking you to test once a week. Don't be lazy. This is part of the aquarium husbandry that you signed up for when you wanted to join this hobby. They didn't say, here's test kits, just use them for the first six months and then put them in a, in a corner and ignore them the rest of your life. That's not how this works. There's so many things that can go wrong in an aquarium, but water testing helps us avoid some of the pitfalls and helps keep everything nice and healthy and happy. I want to encourage you to test your water and then even post them in Club Miller's Reef. Go ahead and let's see your results. I'll post mine there today and then we can compare and see who has the best results. That's what I want to see. Uh, I do appreciate you guys tuning in each week. I, I really appreciate the feedback we get from the channel. A lot of people stumble on me on Facebook, you know, in, in various groups, and they'll say, oh, I watch your videos all the time. And I really do appreciate that you're willing to listen to me ramble on about the things that happen and, and how to keep a healthy tank. And I look forward to seeing you guys again next Saturday. We'll do another live stream. And I hope that you guys enjoy the rest of your weekend. And if it's hot where you are, I hope you stay somewhere nice and cool and safe. I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs> Bye, guys.